Welcome back to Climbing the Interface Ladder, lecture number 4, Advanced Interfaces. Before the break, we took a look on how to make uh, mouse uh, hovering text, you know, the text that appears when you hover the mouse over something, and also how to set up a simple tab system, so we could have different things be being shown depending on which tab we had opened. We're going to use the tab system uh, now in the second part of the lecture, so we can actually draw different things depending on what we want to do. So, the next feature I'm going to add, like the next tab, is going to be the ability to change how high up in the air we want to drop the animals. You know, by default it just drops them at tw well 20 blocks up to into the air, but it would be quite nice to change that. And if we have something like this, this type of setting, it would make sense to have like a slider or a scroll bar or whatever you want to call it. And if we take a look in the graphics from before and zoom in a bit, we can actually see that there you go, we have a bar to slide on and then something to slide with a slider there. And those are exactly what we're going to use now. So we're going to have this as the base and then this thing is going to move back and forth like so when the user is moving it. So let's get going with that. So to do so I obviously need a new tab. So I'm going to create GUI tab. Uh, I guess that can be called height like that. Um, extends GUI tab. There we go. And let's do it in the uh, same way we've done before. So public GUI tab height and yes, ask for the ID. Like so. And then when you, we do the super call, we just give it the, the name right away. So height setting and then the ID. There you go. Um, so how do we implement this? Well, first of all, what we want to do is of course change it here. So GUI tab height. There you go. So now all of a sudden we have that tab there. But it obviously doesn't do anything yet. So that's what we have to do. Okay, so we need a bar and a slider. So let's specify where they should be located. Private, static. Uh, we can make these the static and we can make them final. That's totally fine. Rectangle. So here's the bar. That's the thing behind the slider. I'm going to call that a bar. Uh, new GUI rectangle. And well, place it at 50 and at 100. And then if we take a look at the texture, we can see that it's... Um, I need to zoom this again. There you go. Um, well, we can't see it from the texture, but basically the width of this here is 91 and the height is 6. So what we want to add is obviously 91 and 6. Right, so that's the bar thing there. And the second thing we want to do is private static final GUI rectangle um, slider rectangle and to make that work properly I'm going to put a 75, 97 and how big is it? Well if we take a look here we can see that it is 6 by 11. Well it might be a bit tricky to see but it is 6 by 11 like so. There you go. So now it's just a matter of draw, draw these two things, their backgrounds. Well to start with at least. Bar dot draw so that should be behind it so we draw that first. Uh, and what I want to use here is 0 and 250. Why? Well, if we take a look in the interface, we see that it's very well furthest to the left. It can't go any fur further to the left, so it's obviously 0 there. And, well, we can't go even any well further down either. So, uh, you know, it's at the bottom. And the bottom is 256, but it has its height of 6. So 256 minus 6 equals 250. Okay, that is about a matter of uh, drawing this slider dot draw, and what we want to do is give it to GUI of course, and here I want zero as well. That's also furthest to the left, and then two thirty nine. It is well just on top of the other one of course, but it also has eleven in height, so therefore two fifty minus eleven equals two thirty nine. So these are obviously just where the textures are. Uh, let's take a look on how this will look like by starting Minecraft. Right. So obviously it's not going to move or anything. It's not even going to be possible to make it move at the moment. But we will see that if we click on this tab, as you can see it's saying height setting, we can see here we have the slider. This is the thing we want to slide and here's the, the like the arrow we can slide it in. But obviously nothing happens. We haven't 
well done and made any code to be able to do that. So how do we want to do this? Well, let's set it up like this. First of all, we need to be able to tell the rectangle to change its x position. It's we can't do that. But there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to change it. So I'm just going to add public void uh, set x like this. There you go. And well, we don't need a set y, but just for completeness, I'm just going to add set y as well. Uh, this dot y equals y. There you go. So now we can use that to set it. Okay. But I'm not going to do that when we move it. I'm going to do that just before we draw it for some reason. Well, we'll see see later on why that is the case. So what I want to define here is temp height setting. So that's how well currently where it is. The current um, height setting that we have uh, defined by the sc uh, slider there, or well, the scroll bar. And then what we want to have is a boolean funny if it's dragging or not, okay? Whatever that is. Well, how do we do, well, how do we drag things like these? Like, how do we scroll things? Well, it's not too tricky, actually. We have to do a few things, though. And the first one is, well, when we click, when we click with the mouse, if we manage to click um, on the bar, no, not on the bar, on the slide itself, the slider we want to move, like so, if we manage to do so, well, then what we want to do is, uh, well, first of all, do that. But then what we want to do is say, all right, good, we're now moving the slider, dragging equals true. Obviously, we're, we're moving it now because we just clicked on it. So we should do that. But we're not changing its location. So let's do that, slider dot set x like that. Okay. And obviously, we use the temp height setting. But that wouldn't really work because the bar, well, the bar starts at 50, so it would make sense to have 50 plus that, okay? And therefore, the default would make sense to have 25. We will change these things around, you will see in just a bit. But the point is, we want to move the slider part here where it's going to be drawn, depending on our current setting. And when we click, then what we want to do uh, is to make sure that um, uh, we start drag dragging like that, but then what we want to do now is, well, actually move it. How do we move it? Well, we can get the coordinates of the mouse, so we can just calculate the new position from that one. But obviously, we only want to do that if we're actually dragging the slider. Otherwise, there's no reason to do so. Okay, so what do we want to do? Well, temp height setting equals x. But... Uh, you know, the X coordinate is the, well, that's the very position of the, the uh, mouse. Uh, and we don't want that. We want to remove the GUI, uh, uh, sorry, GUI.getLeft, there you go. Because otherwise it will be like, all right, we just had it 20 pixels from the left side of the interface, but it might be like 125, just because, well, the interface maybe had a uh, border there, a margin to the left edge of the screen. So we need to take care of the... Uh, the uh, left part there. Well, 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 when that's sorted out, then we also need to remove 50, yes, because that's where the bar starts. So we want temp height setting to tell us, well, how long has we scrolled it from the very left? You know, we, we, we increase it to the right there. Um, there you go, that's pretty much it. But this is going to allow us to get invalid values, like values that are outside the actual bar. So what we might want to do is just, all right, temp height setting, if you're less than zero, then we set it to zero. But, well, if you're greater than 85, so that's the other edge, then we, we set it to uh, 85. So that's just a matter of keeping it in, in inside a valid range. There you go. And the f final thing we want to do now, actually, is use the last thing here, mouse released. Oops, that one. And when we release the mouse, we won't just want to say, well, we're not dragging this thing anymore. Yes, the bolts. But as you might remember, I don't know if you noticed that, we're not actually using mouse released. That was something new. So we need to head over up here to the GUI machine and, 
actually implement that. We have mouse clicked and mouse click move, but we don't have mouse moved or up. And as I said the last time, I think it was the last time, uh, this is actually not detecting that the mouse is moving at all. That's an old uh, functionality that has been removed from this method. Now we have the mouse click move instead, like that. So, well, don't bother about this name there. What we want to do is just active tab dot uh, mouse uh, released. There you go. And the button here is the mouse button that we did release. So zero for the left one and right is one. Okay, so now we can do that and we have everything set up. Not for a proper slider in the end, but to start with at least. We tell that if we click it on the slider itself, then we start this process. When we drag it along, then uh, you know, then we update the value and make sure that it is in the correct value, uh, well, in the correct range, but only if we're actually in the mode of dragging this. And then when we release the mouse, then we make sure that, well, stop this, we shouldn't move it anymore. Let's take a look. There you go. So now if you head over to this here, and if I click it, I can drag it. There you go. And if I release the mouse, like so, then, well, it's going to stay there, obviously. Like that. There you go. So when I click it, I start the process of dragging it, and as long as I haven't released it yet, rather than actually pressing it, it's going to allow me to move it. So if I... Um, well, if I basically click outside here, it's not going to do anything. But if I click here, it doesn't matter if I move it when I have the mouse down here. Because otherwise we would have to move it very carefully. So we didn't like mess up. And that's just going to be annoying. So we have to click on it, but then we're just fine to drag however we want. So we can like look here while we're dragging it along. Like that. But obviously this is just handled on the client side. And to synchronize it on the server side, we might have a few problems. Not really problems, but just some bumps in the road that we have to get past, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. But what we want to do is head over to the tile entity, the tile entity machine here. Obviously, if we define something like this, public, uh, I'm just going to make it public, public int height setting, like this, we can store the value in there. And then we can have that value on both the client and the server, and everyone's happy. However, if we just replace the temp height setting with that one instead, well, then when we pick up the, uh, and start to drag things, then we're not going to be able to move it that smoothly. And the reason is because when we move it, we have to send the information to the server, back to the client, before we can actually see it move. And if we move it a lot, just back and forth, we're going to send a lot of information to the to the server side, and that's going to send the information to everyone that has the interface opened. So it's just a lot of extra information. We could do it like that, just send send it all the time as we move it. But the way I'm going to do it is we only send it when we drop it. You know, when we release the mouse, we stop the dragging, and then we can send the updated value to the server. So we don't have to s tell it like, alright, I'm currently just fine-tuning it, you don't have to bother about me, but then when we drop it, then the update is going to happen. So to do so, we still need this temp height setting. So the temp height setting is going to be used um, otherwise, um, well, if we're currently moving it, otherwise we're not. So private void, I'm going to add something here, update slider position. And what is this for? Well, that's basically the part I'm doing up here, like so. But I'm going to make it a bit more advanced, because what we have here is if we're dragging, then we want to use that one. But if we're not, we want to use the real value. So we sort of have a real value and just the temporary one that we're using to not have to having to get the proper one. Because if we use the proper one and just change it that, then the server might tell us a new value and all of a sudden the, the slider is just going to bump somewhere else entirely. So that's why we have two values. Um, um, sorry, gui.machine.height setting like so. Uh, and then 
There you go. So now I can just call this when I want to update this slider's position. And I want to do that when I draw things. But actually, I also want to do that here when I check if it has been clicked. Why? Well, I need to make sure that the slider is actually where it's supposed to be and not just anywhere. And then it's just going to get the current value, whichever that is. So we're when we need to check anything with the slider, we have to do like that. Well, you must say, all right, it's static, so that's why you have to do it. Well, even if it wasn't static, we would have to make sure that it has been updated all the time. And the reason is, we don't really know when this height setting has been updated from the server. So we don't really know if it's in the wrong position or not, so that's going to be the problem. And that's why I have it static, because we would have to do this thing anyways. Okay. What's the next thing? Well, when we start dragging things here, we're obviously going to go from using our our real value to our temporary value. So what that means is that it's the slider is going to jump to whatever the temporary value is set to. So I guess it makes perfect sense to actually set the temporary value to the real value. So when we started dragging, we're actually going to start where the slider were before we started dragging it around which makes perfect sense, so it's actually going to move properly. So that's one thing there, so just move it like so. Another thing is, well, when we drop it, what do we want to do? What do we want to do? Well, obviously we just want to do, do something if we're, if we're already dragging it like so. Otherwise, we don't want to do anything, you just release the mouse because you did something else, you maybe just clicked on the interface and didn't do anything, you know. We won't, don't want to do anything at all. But when we do so, uh, as soon as we drop it, it's, we're going to have the opposite thing here. Uh, we're basically going to uh, change from having the value, well, have read the value from temp height setting to the height setting here. And even if we s send it to the server, it's going to take a tick or two before it bounces back to, our, to the client side. Uh, what that means is that when we when we release it, the slider is going to jump back to where we started dragging it, and then a second not a second later, but a few ticks later, it's just going to jump back where, where you where you dropped it. So it's just going to blink back and forth, which is going to look very ugly. How do we solve this? Well, we can just take the, sh uh, the shortcut that we've used before, just set it on the client side right away. Like that. But obviously, that's not going to be good enough. We, d we don't tell the server about it. We don't... Uh, tell any other clients about it, so this value is not going to be updated and therefore we're not going to use the new value. So, well, we'll have to send some information through the packet handler. But what should we use? You know, send button packets and ship packet. Well, we'll probably have to define something else. And we can totally do so, but it's annoying to just define new things all the time, so what I'm going to do is modify what I have a bit. Okay, so let's go down here, and instead of having to send a button packet, it's quite restricted in my opinion, I'm going to say send interface packet, and instead of the ID, let's send the type and the value. Then we can, well, if we want to have a button, then we can set the type to zero, and the value can be which button we pressed. If we have this grid of the custom layout, we can send it to another type that defines this is the, you know, the custom layout, and the value is obviously the the box in the custom layout that we clicked, and then we can have, right, I move the slider, send another type along, but what should we have as the value then? Well, obviously the current position of the slider, and so on. So I'm just making this a bit more expandable. We're still going to have to write that there, so it knows if it's a ship one or not. Um, write byte, and then I just add the type, like so, and then the value. When we read it, then we obviously get the type and the value. And then we're going to receive that instead, so interface event type and value. Let's head over to the tile entity. Here we go. So there's no issues here, we have just to receive a button event. But I'm going to rename that to receive interface event and then we get the event ID and we get the uh, value basically. Here we go. So I'm just moving some things around but what we want to do now is treat this thing differently depending of which type of ID, well type of event it is, sorry. 
There you go. So if it's case zero, I guess case zero can be um, a normal button, you know, the vanilla buttons that we had before. Well, we still have them in the interface, so something like that. That's totally fine. And then we can add another case, case one here, and do something with with that one. Um, and case one I'm going to use for these guys. So there's no reason to hijack the vanilla buttons. Well. The, the packet uh, packet that we're using for the vanilla buttons uh, now when we have set this up properly. Remember we used the the uh, uh, layout grid with, with the same IDs there and that's why we reduce it by two here because we had two buttons there. So now we well we can just move that one there instead set custom manual and here we can just use the value. There you go. And finally what we want to do is obviously use case 2, which is going to be the slider. Um, what do we want to do here? Well, height setting equals value. We will just get the information like so. There we go. Obviously, we, we will have to change a few things here. So, the tab custom, instead of sending a button packet, what I want to do is send an interface packet. I want to give it ID 1. Remember, that's the one we want to use there. And now we can just send I along instead. We don't have to add 2 to it. So we just have different types of interface packets. There we go. Then we also need to head over to the GUI machine where we send the these things there. And these are the normal buttons. So what we want to do here is interface packet and give it type zero to tell it that it's a normal button. So just reorganize some things there to, to keep it all um, well organized. So um, it's quite important to, to do it properly because if you just add a ton of things when you, you're doing network stuff, in the end you're just going to get lost and you're going to do something weird and everything is going to be broken. So I thought it would be better to just you send the interface packet and we can give it a one byte to tell it what, what, what type of interface packet we have and then some value that goes along with it. You obviously don't have to do it like this, you can, uh, you can send it differently but it's all about that you send it in one way and you know the way you send it so you can read it properly with the packet handler. When, when you receive the packet then on the on the other side. There you go, now we can head over to the, you know, where is it? The, there you go, the tab. So, here you go. Now we can just do send uh, interface packet, give it the byte 2 there, so that's the second one. And finally, we give it the high, oops, the temp. So what we're doing here is basically when we start moving it, we make sure that we well clicked on, on the slider, and if we do did, then we uh, set the drag into true. We also set the temp height setting to be the uh, to get the value from the current well the read setting there. When we drag it, we just move it along uh, depending on where you have your mouse, and then when you release the button, well release the slider, then we want to send the information to the server so the server knows about where this client just move that slider. Okay, is this enough? Well, we need to send information back to the client so the client knows about it, maybe other clients that are currently having this interface opened and so on. And how do we do that? Well, that's the container. So when you synchronize information, that we, we took a look on that last lecture, but when we synchronize information, what we wanted, want to do is you using, um, well, add crafting to crafters, update progress bar, and detect and send changes. So we want to send the default value, like, well, not the default value, but when you open it, you want to get all the values. So send progress bar update. We're already using the 49th, uh, the 49 first IDs, so what we want to have is the 50th ID, which is actually 49. You remember, we start at zero. And then just the value here, and that's going to be machine dot height setting, like that. There you go. How do we do when we receive it? Well, if you want to receive multiple things, then just do it depending on the ID. Like that. So if it actually is one of the first 49 IDs, then we want to use it for the custom uh, layout. Otherwise, well, probably should check that it actually is the 50th ID, but, well, never mind. We can just use it like this. There you go. And now we come to this part. How do we do this synchronization? Well, we want to do it in a similar way that we did before. We had an old data here, we checked if the uh, there was something new there. If there were, then we sent it. Otherwise, you know, 
we didn't do anything and then we saved the data like so. So private int old height live out. And uh, in the end here we set old height to be equals to machine dot height setting. If uh, machine dot height setting is not equals to the old data. So if the um, data has been updated, we obviously need to synchronize that so the client knows about this change. Otherwise, it's not going to do any good at all on the client side if it doesn't know about it. So send progress bar update this. Here we want 49, remember. And here we want machine dot height setting. Are we done now? No, we're not. So, as you might see, we might have to do quite a lot of different things to set up these more advanced um, interfaces. But if you just take one step at a time, it should be fairly simple. And the last step is actually not that, uh, well, advanced. We just want to save the information on the server side. So, um, compound, there you go, dot set byte. We can set it as a byte, that's totally fine. The height. There you go. And finally, the uh, height setting. And here we read it. So height setting equals compound dot get byte height. So now it should work. So the server has control of everything here. Uh, it saves and loads it. So that's that should be fine. But also, when we receive uh, well, this is type of event, it's going to save that on the server side. The server is then obviously going to synchronize that using the container, that's what we have set up. Uh, using this part here, it's saving it like so, and it's also receiving it here and sending it there. So that part looks fine, but then what we do in the tab itself is um, the following. So when you release it, then we want to send the update to the server, but we also take the shortcut and update it on the client side right away. Uh, but the server obviously needs to know about it. Let's take a look on how this works. Right, here we go. And the reason why I was, well, made sure that everything worked, like we saved everything and so on, is the following. How do we know that this works? Well, we don't really know that it's been sent to the server, it's synchronized back to us, really. But take a look here. If we leave it there, if it exits out and goes back in again, where is it? As you can see, it, it is where we left it. If I move it here and we exit out and go back in again, it's going to be where we left it, to the very left. The reason is, of course, when we move it and drop it, well, when we release it again, what's going to happen is we're going to send the information to the server. The ser server is going to process that and store it, and it's also going to distribute that to all the clients that wants it, well, players that have the interface open. And then when we close it down, the server saves it, and when we open it up again, the server loads it, and it's going to distribute it to anyone who wants it, well, a player that opens the interface, and that's exactly what we are. We open the interface and receive where the slider was. And that means that if we had multiple players here looking, if I move the slider, drop it there, then it would move for that person as well. But we can see it moves smoothly anyways, even though we don't send the information until we actually drop the whole thing. Like that. There you go. But this is a bit boring. Let's add some text, shall we? How do we do that? Well, we have a problem. When we draw text, what do we need to do? Well, we need to re refer to the font renderer of the uh, GUI, but we can't access that. We don't have uh, permission. So what I'm going to do is add a fourth and the last wrapper that we're going to use. So where did my GUI machine go? Here we go. So we have get left, we have get top, and we have draw hover string like so. And the last one is just going to be protected uh, font renderer get uh, well font renderer I guess and that's just so we can draw things uh, well draw string and so on strings and so on in the interface 
There you go. So, well, a bit unfortunate that we have to do all of these wrappers here, but well, it works much better if we move the cla well the tabs into the specific classes and so on. So I think it's a very cheap price worth paying for. Um, right, so let's head back here. And now it's about matter of just typing this all out. So um, well, GUI dot draw string, not draw string. Get font renderer dot draw string. There you go. Uh, and we want uh, which one? That one, I think. So we have the text, the coordinate, and finally the uh, color. And the color is just going to be, uh, you know, the normal gray one 0x, 40, 40, and 40. There you go. The coordinate, well, well, that depends on where you want it, where you want it to look good, obviously. But I think, si not 50, 60, 88 looks good. So if we take a look on where we have the bar here, we have it at 50 and 100. So that means that, well, we move the text 10 pixels to the right, so it's not at the very edge of the bar, but it's still, uh, well, starts qu pretty near that. And we want the text to be above, or well, I want it to be there, so therefore I move it up about 12 pixels from the actually bar there. So it's sort of going to be on top and should be looking quite all right. Height. Uh, and then I want to print out the height. What's the current height? What's the current height setting? That could be either temp height setting or the GUI machine dot height setting. Hmm. But I'm already calculating it here. So what I'm going to do is just uh, steal that and then do private int uh, get a current height, you know. Return that part there. And uh, like that. GUI uh, machine. We need GUI for that. So we just send that along. And then it doesn't matter, we get current height, like that. There you go. So now the update slider position works as well. Without, well, we haven't destroyed it or anything. But then we can just use get current height like that and did you I like so. There you go, now it should work. Let's take a look. Right click here and uh, go in here. So there you go, height 65. And when I move it around, it's going to update. But when I release it, it's going to stay. We don't see why, but what's happening is basically we're swapping back to the read value. But we set the read value so it works quite all right. But just having a slider here uh, doesn't really well give us too much. It uh, obviously is supposed to tell us where to drop the animals. And that's going to be fairly simple to add a fairly simple thing to add for us. Um, so I head over to the block machine, the one dropping the anvils here, block machine. Scroll down to um, here where it's dropped. As you can see we have 20 all over the place and that's where we have been dropping it before. But what we can do is just do machine dot a height setting. Obviously this is going to drop it between 0 and 85 blocks up into the air and if we wanted to well we can do it like that and that's exactly how I'm going to do it but we can also like oh right I don't want it to be well modified one block each time we move it you know we move it one pixel and that's going to be one block that might be a lot that may be and, or maybe even too too little. So what we can do is like, all right, divide it by four and then add 20. So it's always 20 blocks into the air. But then for each fourth pixel, we're going to modify it by one. So you you don't have to in any way at all modify the value you're using in the slider for well one to one. So yes, because we moved one pixel doesn't mean that we have to modify whatever we do. Well, modify that bit one. Maybe you just want the slider to scroll through three different images or something like that. Well, what do we do? Well, we just tell it, oh, right, have you moved this a third of the way? Yeah, you have. Okay, sw swap a uh, picture like so. So we can just uh, divide it by, uh, you know, it's 85 pixels long. We can divide it like, what do we have? 
like almost 30, so like so 28 or something like that. That's going to be about 0, 0.1 to uh, 0, 0.1 or 2, depending on where the slider is and so on. But that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going, just going to add machine dot height setting here right away. Um, we don't have to bother about recalculating it or anything, and just replace it all the time here when we use 20. Oops. Pasting machine dot height setting. So all of a sudden it should be working. Instead of dropping it 20 uh, meters up into the air, we drop it at a custom uh, setting like that. And if you wanted to, we could default height to be 20. Um, so well, if we don't change anything, it's going to drop 20 blocks into uh, the air. I will do that as soon as we have uh, in this part. Like that. So now, if I set it to well, we can go with 85, I guess. Um, I'm going to yeah, that's a shape as good as any. Well, I needed that button. There we go, and then give it some anvils to drop. Uh, so now 85 into the air. Well, that's fine. If I click now and take a look, there you go. They come after a while because they spawn so high into the air. We can of course also spawn them at like, alright, two blocks into the air, that's totally fine. Alright, I destroyed the button. Uh, there you go, they are spawned there. Now I can't even spawn them anymore because they are sort of occupied already. Uh, but we can set it to whatever we want here and it's totally going to work. There we go. Nice! So we have a slider, a working slider, and if we wanted to scroll things with it, like use it at a scroll bar, then we would just use the um, uh, the height setting here, which I'm going to set to 20 by default, uh, we would just use that one to modify the location of the objects. In the same way that we use it to modify the location of the slider, we do use it to modify uh, where, where those images were drawn. So they would move to the right or move to the left, you know, maybe move up and down as well, um, just to make it scroll. So the whole point here is just a slider and then we can use that for scrolling or in this case setting where we want to drop these animals, how far up into the air. And that's pretty much it for this tab here. Let's head over to the last tab. So what's that going to be about? Well, it's going to be a bit ridiculous. Uh, there's no real use of it. But you know, if you have the player inventory open, like the normal... Um, survival one. You can see a little dude there. You can see Steve. He's looking at you or whatever. whatever. He's doing what you want. So what is that? Well, that's basically a model being drawn in an interface. And it might be quite nice to be able to do things like that. So we're not going to draw Steve in the interface, no. We're going to draw the falling anvil in the interface. Um, not just well, not a specific falling anvil, but just a falling anvil. And it's not going to fall or anything. Um, yes, because, well, an anvil is obviously a block, that's a block in the world, but when it falls, it can't be a block, because then it would only take up, some, well, some specific location, it would go one meter at a time, so what is actually happening is that it's being converted to an anvil, uh, well, an entity that looks like the block, and then it falls down, and then when it f hits the ground, it's being converted, the entity is being converted to a block, or basically placing a block there, and that's the way sand works, it's basically... Uh, a sort of a retextured sand block. But, um, well, let's do that. So what we need to do is create this class here. I'm, I'm going to call it GUI tab preview. We will take a preview of an anvil. I don't know. That will probably be all right. Extends GUI tab like so. Uh, here we go. Add constructor. But we don't want that because that's going to ask us for a name as well, and we want to define it here. Well, that's totally fine to do the other way as well, but I'm going to do it like this. And we get the ID like so, and we give it the um, name Anvil uh, view, I guess, and then the ID. There you go. So what's the last step to make this work? Well, obviously there's just a ton of things, but what we want to do is head over to the machine interface, and replace the placeholder here, the test one, with the preview one. Preview. So all of a sudden, we have three unique proper tabs here that we're going to use, or at least we have two proper ones and one that we're currently working on. 
And as you can see, it's very easy to just add more tiles. You can just do like new and add another one. Maybe we don't have enough room, but then we'll have to make the tabs a bit sm smaller or the interface a bit bigger, or well, make the tabs scroll as well. Okay, head back here. So this part here might be a bit advanced, it might be a bit confusing, so I'm going to go through it uh, quite uh, slowly and hopefully um, you will understand what's going on. But before we head to the actual rendering part, uh, and that's the, the part there that's going to be uh, quite a lot of new things, uh, what we want to do is have an anvil here and we need to create that anvil. And as you might guess, well, we're creating this on the client side, right? Yes, we are. It's on it's on the client side. On the server side, well, we don't have this tab at all. So, what? What's going on with that? Well, we're not going to spawn this entity in the world. We're just going to create a new entity. And, well, normally we would do that on the server side and then spawn it. But here we're just going to create it and well, we don't care to put it in the world itself. However, we still need to give it a world and it will make sense to give it a uh, declined world. We have to give it a world of some sort. And on the client side we can just refer to minecraft.getminecraft.dworld to get the world of this current thingy. Um, well, you know, where the, the uh, person that is playing is. Uh, and then we need to give it the location that we want to spawn it in. It doesn't really matter because we're just going to use it for rendering anyways. But here's the important part. We need to give it the ID uh, block anvil dot block ID. So we're actually just creating a new entity falling sand but we give it the ID of the anvil and that's how it works. Uh, if we give it the sand head it will look like sand. If we give it you know, gravel, it will look like gravel. If we, if we give, give it, um, I don't know, let's say a furnace, then we will have a falling furnace. That's totally going to work, actually. So, um, you can just make a falling of whatever you want. And you can actually specify the, uh, if we add another number here, we can specify the metadata as well. So you can make it drop whatever, like a, a wool block of a specific color. That, that's going to work. So, we need to import the um, entity here, like so, so we can do that. Okay, now to the rendering part. So how do we render this anvil inside the, uh, well, interface? And what we need to refer to are a few new things. Uh, and we're going to refer to them, uh, well, they are located in GL11, and then we can use all of these different methods here. And basically what this is, that that's open GL code, so we're going to refer to that directly. Usually when we render things, when we render the interface, when we, when we well, when we render blocks as well, and render most of the things, we basically, well, for blocks, we just give it the icon it wants to use. Uh, when it comes to the interface, we just bind a texture and tell it to draw a specific uh, rectangle and so on. And we don't have to bother about how that happens, but in the end, it's obviously using more advanced code to actually do the proper rendering. And usually we can just ignore how that is done, but sometimes we need to dig deeper and do some more advanced things ourselves, and that's the case here. There's no like, all right, just render this in the interface at this specific coordinate in this size, this rotation method um, for an entity. Um, if th that would be the case, then we would just be able to call that and everything would be fine. But what we're doing here is just setting it up ourselves. And the first thing we need to do is GL push matrix like that. So the way this works is that we have a lot of different matrices or different layers. And when we add a new layer, what that means is that we, when we're going to apply filters of some sort, we'll see that in a bit, when we apply those, we're going to do that to this layer. That doesn't mean that we won't use the filters of, of previous levels um, or layers that we have on top of each other. But what it means is when we apply something new, we're going to put that in this top layer. That means that when we remove this top layer that we're going to do afterwards, then we're going to lose all the filters that we just applied. Why do we want to do that? Well, the reason why we want to do that is, well, we obviously want these filters to well, to be able to draw, uh, render this properly, but after we're done, we want to clean up after ourselves and therefore remove everything uh, not everything we drew, but everything we basically used. So, th well, 
think about it like you have you have a kids party and they just eat a lot of I don't know cake and so on it gets very messy they draw some finger painting and so on you don't want that on the table right you add a blanket on top or plastic or cover it in I don't know newspaper whatever and then what when they're drawing with the finger finger colors or I eat a lot of cake and everything it just gets me a mess it's going to be done that on the well on the plastic blanket or whatever you have there uh, it's still going to be there they can see it and they can play with it you shouldn't play with the food but then afterwards you can just remove it altogether and you still have the table there but during the well the mess there you also had the table so what we want to do is add this layer then we want to apply fil filters do the rendering then remove everything uh, again the rendering will still be there but because that's what we have been drawing but all the filters have been removed and how do we remove one level uh, one layer well we do the opposite pop matrix so these always comes in pairs otherwise we will have tons of errors in your code they will just spam you will have console spam saying all right you have a push matrix here but it's n you don't have a matching pop so you just add layers and layers and layers and everything goes wrong or if you try to remove the layers all the time without adding them you're also going to be in trouble that doesn't mean that we can add another layer here and then remove another layer that's totally fine right so inside here we're going to do our rendering code what we want to do first of all is do, uh, do something called GL translate like so and what this is going to do is allow us to move where we're drawing think, of, think about it as we have a big canvas a big canvas where we're going to draw a painting you have like uh, maybe you have a friend that uh, well can't really move too much maybe uh, paralyzed in, in in that person's legs and so on uh, but it likes to do do some some paintings and so on uh, sitting in a wheelchair and so on and, and draws just in, fr in front of that that person well yeah you know but all of a sudden well the canvas is obviously full of, of, of drawings in that location what do you do if you want to draw somewhere else well you can just move that person's wheelchair to the right and that means that even if that person draws in the same location uh, compared to where 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 he or her sits, it's still going to be drawn in s somewhere else. Just because you moved your origin of of drawing, so the thing that is drawing has been moved, and that's exactly what we want to do. When we draw the the um, you know the model in the end, what we want to do is well, we just want to draw it. That we can't really define too much with it, but what we want to do is tell it well, we want to draw things in this location rather than the default one. And to do so, what we need to give it is, well, our old friend get left, and then plus 90. So we get to the left of the interface, or well, you know, yeah, to the left of that, and then we add 90. That's going to be sort of in the middle of the whole thing, just to center it a bit. And then what we want to do here is a similar thing, gui dot get top at plus 100. That's going to be sort of in the tab there, it's going to look pretty good. Then we have a third dimension. So yeah, we have three dimensions even when we draw textures, well, when we draw interfaces. And we can totally just do minus 500 and this, uh, well, when, when we render this model, well, we're going to do that behind, well, the, the background. That's a bit silly, so we shouldn't really do that. So well, let's move it forward by 100 um, and that's going to basically place it in the front and it's look going to look quite alright. So that's the first thing. You, we just move our origin of uh, drawing so we don't draw, uh, well, when we draw it in, in the very center, like 0, 0, we're not going to draw it up in the very top left of the screen. And that's, this is actually why when we draw things in background and foreground, well, the, the coordinates are different because somewhere between these guys here, we have, well, the, the vanilla code uses some sort of translate like this. But now we're going to do that ourselves there. The next thing we want to do is to scale the whole thing. Otherwise, it's going to be very, very small, like this. So I'm going to scale it to like 30, like so, GL11. GL scale, uh, there you go, scale, scale, scale. So we just do that in all three dimensions. We obviously have a three dimensional model that we want to draw. So what do we do here? Well, basically what we do um, is, well, when we want to draw something, uh, 
and well, we draw it in very small. If we, however, t tell the person, well, can you, can't you draw, draw a bit bigger? Like the, maybe you draw, um, you know, you you draw a picture inside your little canvas there. You have a small canvas and draw so it takes up all the canvas you you know uh, you want it to fit your your stick figure there should fit the whole canvas be a happy a sun in the corner and so on however if you increase the canvas to be enormous and you want to do the same thing you want to have your stick figure taking up the whole canvas and then you do draw the sun and so on then well obviously it's going to be much bigger so what we're doing here is just scaling everything up and then when we draw things they are going to look much much bigger uh, like so but here comes the weird part this dimension should be negative and that's just how the models are set up so to make it look properly we want that dimension to scale sort of in a negative direction and the only thing that, that does is to fit with this uh, the way the models have been set up we will talk more about models in the next course if you're taking that one as well but when we've done that part we have well a few things left but we're going to skip them from now. Uh, what I want here is render helper dot enable standard lighting. So that's where you just change how the uh, lighting works. And we have to disable that manually afterwards. Uh, render helper dot disable standard item lighting, like so. And now we come to the rendering code. How do we render this? Well, here we go. Render manager dot instance dot render entity entity with position and jaw but we shouldn't define those yes because um, well we don't care about the three dimensional position we, we have sort of defined how it should look like in the interface which uh, is a bit different so we're not going to bother about the coordinate system where it's being drawn those are obviously used when we draw it in the world and um, and uh, what I think I have one too many. All right, no, sorry. Here's the jaw. Uh, we don't care about that either. And finally, that's the tick uh, uh, float, uh, the the partial tick time, which basically means how long it has been taken from the last tick. So we have like, if we have a higher F FPS than the tick rate, which we usually have, then we obviously n want to know how long it was since the last tick. So if you, for instance, have an entity that is moving at each tick, you want to make a smooth it rendering is smoothly. Um, so if you have it at one position at one tick and at another position at the next tick, what you want to do is just to make that uh, movement uh, to work smoothly. And to do so, you need to know how long was it since we moved, and that's the last thing. But th we don't need that either. The only thing we want to do is draw the anvil like so. So this is it. This is it for a very basic version. We're going to expand a bit later on, but um, I think we should take a look. But before that, yes, let's go through this again. What do we do? We add this new layer that we can uh, add things to. What we add to it is a translate like so. So we move the whole uh, drawing um, a, a bit. And then we rescale it all. And then when we're done, we remove those two things. So we're going to leave it as we found it. We're not going to leave the translate. That's just going to make, uh, make sure that everything is a mess. And if we do the rescaling, everything is also going to be a mess. Just make sure to, to reset those by popping the matrix that we pushed in the beginning. In here we just draw the thing like that using render entity with pause your. Let's take a look. Here we go. Right, head over to this machine here and I click on the third tab. As we see now, the third tab is saying anvil view, and oh, yeah, that's an anvil. But first of all, it's upside down, and second of all, well, it looked weird, and that's because we are taking a look at it from one view. So, what we're going to do is rotate it properly. That's the part I left out. But as you can see, we're actually drawing it in sort of the middle of the tab here, not exactly, but it's being drawn like that as we have been specified specifying here and it's being drawn in the in a size that we have been specifying here if we didn't change the scale it would be very tiny a bit d smaller than the the size of that button there all right that's actually outside of your screen sorry uh smaller than the button here uh and we don't want that that would be silly 
So that looks pretty good, but let's rotate it properly. So first of all, we want to rotate it so it actually faces the correct side up. I think that's a good thing to do. And to do this, we're going to refer to GL11, GL rotate, and uh, we have uh, well four different parameters here. The first one is how much should we rotate it with. Well, if we want to turn it upside down. Well, it is upside down already, but we, if we turn something that is upside down, upside down, it's obviously going to face the correct side up. The reason why it's upside down? Well, that's how the model is created. It happens to be upside down, um, compared to the normal way of drawing. So 180 degrees, that's half of 360, which is one full lap, like so. So we're using the degrees here, not radians or anything. So 180, like so. What's the next thing to do? Well, we have x, y, and c here, and we are using those to define which axis we're going to rotate it around, right? And what we want to do is just define 0, 0, and 1. So we want to rotate it around this uh, c axis like so. So that's just which dimension we want to rotate this in. But that's not everything. This is well, this is going to place it properly, so we so it has it upside well the up facing upwards sorry uh, but w it was a bit still I think I think it would like make um, make a much better view if it actually rotated a bit like it spinned around don't you think yeah so what I'm going to do is uh, rotate it in another dimension uh, by adding one there and zero in these two and uh, the angle I'm going to give it is uh, something I call raw uh, when we rotate things in different dimensions, what we have um, is roll, pitch, and uh, jaw, and basically that depends on well, your well, what the front of your model is, and that's just in different names of uh, of rotations. So we would call this a pitch uh, if you wanted to store it as something like that. So we have roll and jaw here. Obviously those are not defined, but I'm going to define them and we're going to use them to make it look pretty nice. Private float jaw, like so. Private float roll. And finally a variable here that I'm going to call raw down. We'll see in just a second. So now if we have those two, uh, we can just make it face upwards, then uh, well, tilt it a bit basically, and this is going to be used to spin it around its own uh, sort of upwards axis. So uh, that would be like the same thing as running around round of the anvil, while this is sort of, uh, well, it bumps uh, back and forth to the side rather than rotating. Uh, but we'll take a look uh, how it's going to look like. So that's just the rendering code, but when we have done the render code, what we want to do is update these values for the next time we render it. The yaw is easy, that's just going to go round and round, so let's increase it by 0 0.5, so half a, a degree each time it's being rendered. Obviously what's happening now is that we're going to update it uh, each time we render, so it's going to spin in a different speed depending on the FPS. And well, that's maybe not how we want it, and if that's not what we wanted, then we could update it in the tile entity instead. But I don't think it matters too much, this is just a, a graphical, um, well, rendering anvil for, for show. So I think it's totally fine to control it from, from here, so it's actually controlled by the FPS. Each time we draw it, we also update it. Okay, so that's the yaw, that's easy, but I'm going to make it look quite good with a roll, and what I want to do is that it's going to roll up and down all the time, so it's not going to do full turns, because if it do that, it's just going to get upside down all the time, well, half of the time, basically. Um, so, here we go. So, if it's supposed to roll down, then I want the roll to be decreased, okay? If that's the case, um, like so, if roll is less than minus 5, uh, there we go, roll down equals false, and roll equals minus 5. So what I'm doing here is, if it's rolled down, then we roll it downwards until it reaches a degree of minus 5. If so, we set it to minus 5 to just keep it in that position and uh, not go past it, and then we tell it to start rolling up again by setting roll down to false. And then we want to do the opposite here, so if roll, uh, well, if we roll up, then we want to increase, oh, I said that wrong, it should, shouldn't be three zeros, just two. 
otherwise it will barely move like that so we move it upwards instead and this time if it reaches 25 um, like that so we're going to tilt it further in that direction then we tell it to go down again true roll equals 25 so there we go um, just a bit of neat uh, code for updating that the jaw is just being around all the time whereas the jaw is going uh, well not the jaw the roll is going to bump up and down you will see exactly what I mean when we start it so let's do that There we go. Let's open this thing here. Uh, it's night. I can't find anything. Silly Minecraft. There you go. If I click here, look at that. So now it, it's facing the correct side up and we also get the 3D impression because now we're obviously rotating it so we can actually see it in different angles and that's very important when we want to see things in 3D. Uh, well normally in uh, real life you can just see it with both your eyes but on the screen we obviously have to give the impression with uh, you know uh, lighting and so on. And we can do so by rotating something like that. And as you can see, now we can see a lot of the top, but we are changing the roll, so now we can't see a lot of the top anymore, um, like that. But then it's going to start rolling back like that. There you go. So we're not just uh, updating the roll all the time. That would make it spin over and get upside down in the end. But we're making it roll back and forth a bit like that. But as you also can see, it's spinning around um, all the time in the other direction and that's the yaw that we're just updating all the time. There we go. Pretty neat in my opinion. And uh, if you've seen the cart assembler from Steve's Carts 2 then well this is the code for rendering that. Um, updating the yaw like this and then we have roll down um, so we roll it downwards and when we reach the specific point then we start to roll it up again. So now we can do something similar to that. So we push the matrix, we translate it, we scale it, we rotate it properly, we draw it and then we pop the matrix to remove the rot rotation code, the scaling and the translation. Since we have already rendered the entity it doesn't matter that we remove these rotations and translations and so on. And then we just update the rotation for the next time. There we go. That's pretty much it for today. But we're missing a few things that I haven't added yet. And what we should do is uh, tell it that this only... Oops. Sorry. Side only. We should tell it that we only have these tabs on the, uh, on the client side. Like that. And the reason why is because, well, we might be using like a lot of things that only exist on a client, so we shouldn't be able to refer to them on the server and so on. So what I'm going to do is just head over to these classes and tell them, well, you you are only a part of the uh, client. So that's just the last thing I want to do here. It's not going to do too much of a difference um, when we just test it here, but when you export the mod and want to play it, then it might uh, make quite a difference. So there you go. There you go. And as you can see, we already have that on the actual interface, and that's how it's supposed to be. But now, when we refer to those other things, then we only want them on the client like that. So let's take a last look on what we have. Save that, of course. There we go, and open it up. So now we have it properly with, with that side of it. But like I said, it's not going to show as a difference now in the testing environment. But what I want to show now is the finished result. This is what we have done in the last four lectures. We started with an interface that, well, what did we have? Well, we didn't even have a text hit uh, saying silly machine. We just had these three slots and the player's inventory. But now we've seen how we can make tabs. We have um, well, mouse over mouse hovering text. We have mouse hovering text that depends um, 
on well which rectangle we have here and we have them in different colors they depend on what we have here we synchronize this data between the server and the client and we also have different textures depend ah, depending on if we're hovering the mouse over them or not we can click things here we're going to send that information with a packet handler to the server and get the information back on the client side so everyone can see it we can also uh, use a make a slide like this we draw text that is dynamic and this is also dynamic like so we're rendering a entity inside the interface like so it's rotating like that and looks very fancy in my opinion we have this bar here that is automatically being updated depending on the amount of annuals we have we draw things dep depending on the the information in the tile entity in different ways we have different buttons here that can actually do things like so and here we also have the icon of course of something and in this case the block itself so quite a lot of things here quite a lot of, lot of things have been uh, discussed in this course um, this is what I want to leave you with when you have these different components all the things I went through here we can draw text we can draw models we can draw uh, rectangles from texture we can draw icons buttons and so on and so forth basically w when we want to make interfaces we just put all of those things together make them do what we want them to do and just code it make the interface code it together make it work test it practice of course a lot um, that's a very important part of this but basically by using all of these things you have here you can do very very advanced interfaces all interfaces that you can see for instance in Steve's cards 2 can be done with the information from these four uh, lectures in this course it's just a matter of practicing a bit and applying it properly so that's pretty much it but before I end this course and this lecture I want to uh, go through uh, the part that we discussed in this very lecture. So here we go, we started with mouse hovering text um, and well what do we need to do? Well we need to make sure that the mouse is actually within the rectangle otherwise we don't want to show that text. Then we just add some text to an array, with, there we go, or well, an array list, so we have array list there, we have some text there, we add that text there and finally use draw hovering text like so. And to do so, we give it the uh, list of, of well lines basically. Then we give it the coordinates of the mouse, which we have to well subtract the GUI left and GUI top from. Yes, because we draw this in the foreground layer, and the foreground layer doesn't know about GUI left and GUI top. Well, doesn't care about it anyways. But if we want to get some colors, we could set up a simple enum enumeration here. And here we see some of the values: black, blue, yellow, and white. And we also ha have the constructor, but that's not here. But the, the important part here is to give it that tag. So we have backslash U O O A seven, and then a number there, or a hexadecimal number from zero to F. So we have zero to nine, and A to F for ten to fifteen. So that's just the, the code for that. And then when we set it up like that, not necessary, of course. But then we can just have the same code as we had before but we added colors like so so gui color dot green gui color dot red and gui color dot yellow pretty easy and um, if we want to make a tab system we just create a bunch of tabs here gui tab custom tab high tab preview and then the important part is to well we just tell the active tab to do its thing so if the active tab well want to draw background then the act active tab is going to do that but we don't tell it all the tabs to do that. If we would tell all the tabs to do that, then everyone would draw their things on top of each other. So the tab that is active does the job, and that's basically going to mean that the other tabs won't do anything. They will be completely idle and won't do anything at all. Then we could set up a slider here, and this is not all the code for it, of course, but it, it is the basics of it, not the synchronization part or anything. But when we click um, click on the actual slider then we want to set the dragging to be true so we start the dragging there then we want to use mouse move click to control the movement so basically if we're currently dragging then we want to update the temp height setting depending on where the mouse is of course we have to keep in mind where you are well where get left is and also where this bar starts where the sliding bar starts so that's 50 in this case so that's why I subtract by 50 and in the end we also want to tell it to stop dragging this thing 
uh, if we actually release the mouse. But as we saw during the lecture itself, we obviously have to keep in mind that, alright, when we release it, maybe we should send it to the server. When we start dragging, we might want to get the information from this, uh, from well, from the tile entity itself. And when we move it around, we might want to make sure that it's actually in a proper range. Those part has just been removed here to uh, make room for the rest. Then we had the rendering of a model, quite a lot of new things here. Uh, but what we want to do is get prepared to draw things. We add a new matrix, a new layer of rendering, which we clean up in the end. We just remove that, so everything we have, d we have done, all the different translations and rotations are being removed. What we have rendered are, of course, still being rendered. Uh, we set the position like so, we use GL translate there, so we give it the left and the plus 90, the top plus 100, that's just where we want it, and by giving it 100 in the last dimension as well, we're going to move it forwards so it's uh, in front of the um, you know, the, the interface itself. Then we want to scale it, the first dimension there negative, a bit confusing, but that's just how the model is set up. Uh, we want to apply the rotations there, so the first one is just to flip it completely, so uh, 180 there in uh, one dimension, but then we apply roll and jaw there just to make it look good. We had a spin spinning anvil that rolled up and down a bit like so. And then we come to the actual important part, well, everything is important, but the core part, rather, we withdraw the entity itself with render manager dot instant dot render entity with position and jaw. And that's pretty much it for today. Uh, remember that we have the questions and exercises document, so questions to answer, and then you have the, uh, the answers, sorry, in the end of the document. Exercises to do with possible solutions in the end, and also further explorations if you want to go further. I believe the ones for today, the further exploration, is to make sure that the anvil can be dragged along with the mouse. So it's spinning on its own, but you should be able to click on it and start to drag it yourself so it starts to rotate. So that's the further exploration, I think. For uh, for today, but also remember this is the last lecture of this course, which means well we have an assignment as well. So that's going to be uploaded and will be available on the uh, course page in just a few minutes after this has been finished. So if you watch this live, you might have to wait like two minutes. If you watch this recorded, then it's already live for you to do. So if you do that, you just send the result in to me, and there's some information in the document itself. And if I think it met all the requirements, then you pass the course, and that's about it. You're, you, you are done there. Very good, very good job. But if it didn't meet the requirement com requirements completely, you, you don't fail the course. The only thing you will have to do is send it in again. I'm going to give you feedback of what was wrong, what do you have to do better, and then you can just send it in again. And if something was wrong that time, then you can just uh, continue to send it in. So that's pretty much it. Um, this has been Climbing the Interface Ladder, lecture number four, Advanced Interfaces. This has also been the whole uh, course, climbing the interfaces, uh, not climbing the interface, climbing the interface ladder, sorry, I've been VSWE and I hope to see you next time. And the next time is another course, it's about entities, uh, uh, the anatomy of a Minecraft model, so it's more models rather than entities. So we will take a closer look on how we can work with models, we touched the models a bit before, but we'll take a closer look on that, how do we create our own models, how do they work, how do we animate them, and so on and so forth. But that's about it, if you take the next course, I hope to see you then, goodbye.